Esther is on trial for murder. That was when I started to be afraid, more afraid than when I had led my men up a hillside through a crossfire of Nazi machine guns. Welcome, armchair detective to Tales of Murder, the channel that brings you classic and out-of-print murder mystery and crime fiction stories from authors you've never heard, spanning the golden age of mystery fiction, 1860 through the 1950s. In today's gripping episode, unfeeling, fearless, the little men of doom came stalking, and death's doorways yawned for Lieutenant Hull and his lovely wife, on trial for murder. Seven Doorways to Death Complete Unusual Mystery Novel By Russell Gray Author of The Lady Smiles at Fate Originally published in Crack Detective Stories, November 1943, Volume 4, Number 6 be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you'll never miss a suspense-filled story brought to you by Tales of Murder, for readers with time to kill. Chapter 1 The First Doorway When I got off the train at Mandale, a couple of reporters were waiting for me at the station. Lieutenant Hull, one of them asked. Impatiently I nodded as I looked up and down the platform for Esther. The prospect of newspaper space didn't flatter me. I had done no more than tens of thousands of other soldiers, but I happened to be the first of the local boys to return from service in North Africa. At that, it had been nothing more heroic than a severe fear which had caused me to be sent home for arrest. Ask your questions, I said, but hurry them. I'm expecting somebody. The other passengers had drifted off. The platform was almost deserted now. Why wasn't Esther here? It's true she was never on time for an appointment, but this was different. We hadn't seen each other for fifteen months. All the way from New York I had ridden with a vision of her eagerly waiting for me at the station. Would you care to make a statement on how you feel about the whole thing? A reporter asked. Well, the war's pretty big to be covered by a statement, I said. Anyway, I'm a soldier, not a politician. If you'll ask me specific questions. The reporters looked at each other. One said, Sure, we'd like to write up your war experiences. But some other time. Of course you came back because of your wife. What were they getting at? The army doesn't send you across the ocean to visit your wife. I got a nasty fever. We know. But you're on your way to see your wife now, aren't you? So what? I was getting sore. That's nobody's business. It's not even good copy for a scandal sheet. Then I saw Major George Alcott. Let Lieutenant Hull alone, he ordered. He stuck a hand through my arm and virtually dragged me off the platform. I can be trusted, sir, I said somewhat angrily. I wouldn't have told them anything I shouldn't. We had reached the street. Major Alcott looked me over solemnly. He still hadn't smiled or even shaken my hand, though he and my father had been firm friends, and he had known me since I was a kid. You don't look bad, Chuck, he said. A trifle peaked, but that's all. I feel fine, sir. The Major's eyes widened a little and then shifted away. Fine, he echoed. Have you read any recent papers? There were a couple of New York papers six weeks old on the ship. When I landed last night, I hadn't time or patience to look at a paper. Why do you... I stopped looking at him. Is anything wrong? Why were those reporters so curious about my wife? So you don't know, he muttered. Know what? It's two months since I received a letter from Esther. My fingers dug into his sleeve. Is she all right? He said quietly, Esther's on trial for murder. There was a silence. I suppose there was plenty of noise in the street, but I heard only my own breathing. I fumbled a cigarette out of my pocket and lit it without remembering to offer the major one. Of course there's a mistake, I said. I don't know. The district attorney is convinced that Esther is guilty. The trial started yesterday. That was when I started to be afraid, more afraid than when I had led my men up a hillside through a crossfire of Nazi machine guns. I said, Has she a good lawyer? Edgar Jocelyn. He's a good man. The cigarette was straw in my mouth. I threw it from me. Tell me about it, sir. You know Roy Balls, he said. He and I went to school together. He inherited his father's chain store business, when I was sent abroad, he gave Esther a job in his office to keep her from getting too lonely. Is he also helping Esther? No, 
He is the man who was murdered. I said nothing. What was there for me to say? I waited for Major Allcott to go on, and it was obvious that he hated to. Roy Bors lived in a swanky apartment house on Park Lane, he said. One night a few weeks ago the neighbors heard a shot and called the police. Bors was lying dead in the living room, shot through the back of his head. Esther lay half on and half off the couch. She was dead drunk and had passed out. No, I whispered. Esther was never drunk in her life. Major Alcott dropped his eyes. It was plain what he was thinking. Fifteen months is a long time for an attractive young woman to be separated from her husband. She got lonely and Roy Bors was a gay, handsome boss. Bors had always liked the bottle. She learned to drink from him. In her loneliness, she went up to his apartment and then Bears got too fresh. I can take it, sir, I said. What's the rest? The luger that killed Bors was found in Esther's hand. Was it Bors gun? No. Recently Bors had bought a revolver, but it was a Smith Wesson. This gun was a luger. The prosecution contends that you captured it from a German and sent it to Esther as a souvenir. That's a lie. Major Alcott shrugged. If you say so, Chuck, I believe you. But you must understand that the prosecution expects you to deny it. What does Esther have to say? She says she never saw the Luger before and didn't murder Roy Bors. Her story is that she passed out while Bors was alive and well, and that the next thing she knew the police were bringing her out of it. There was a solid lead weight in the pit of my stomach. She admits that she drank with Bors in his apartment? She admits it was the third time in ten days she was up there with him. The Major cleared his throat noisily. The trial is being held in the county courthouse in Centre City. I'd go with you if I could, but I have official duty. He shook my hand and mumbled something about luck and strode off. Centre City, the county seat, was only two stations farther up the line, but I learned from the ticket agent that the next train was an hour and twenty minutes off. Out in the street again I found that the passengers who had gotten off the train with me had used up all available taxis. It seemed to me that I would go slowly mad if I had to wait. I was standing at the curb, sweeping the street with my eyes for a possible returning taxi, when a battered coup pulled up. The man leaned toward me. Taxi? This isn't a hack, I said. I realize that, but I am in need of extra money, and if you are in a hurry... I'm in a hell of a hurry, I said. I opened the door and then hesitated without knowing why. It wasn't because the man was operating a taxi illegally. With my wife on trial for murder, I hadn't the time or the mood to let that stop me, and certainly there was nothing wrong with the man behind the wheel. He was rather small and timid-looking, and he wore glasses so thick that I couldn't see his eyes behind them. Okay, I said, Center City. I got in beside him and put my head against the seat and closed my eyes. When I opened them, I was within two blocks of the cottage where Esther and I had lived the home I had thought I was coming back to for my sick leave. But Esther was now in a prison cell, and if she was found guilty, her lovely body would be strapped to an electric chair and the life would be burned out of her. The coop left the city and started to climb the rugged hill which separated Mandate from Centre City. Fortunately, the driver was not talkative. In fact, since I'd gotten in beside him, he had not uttered a word, under the circumstances that suited me. The road across the hill was famous for its scenic beauty. On the right rose sheer rock formations studded by trees growing at insane angles. On the left the hill dropped abruptly for a good five hundred feet. Only a skimpy wooden rail ran along the edge of the cliff. In my high school days one of my classmates, driving his father's car, had gone over the edge. It had been horribly messy. Something about the driver caused me to look sharply at him. He was hunched far over the wheel, gripping it so intensely that his knuckles were white. His head shifted toward me his eyes leaving the winding road. Careful, I warned. His thin lips drew back over his teeth. Though it was not even a warm day, sweat glistened on his brow. And now, through the thick lenses of his glasses, I could see his eyes. His pupils had turned into weird pinpoints. Watch the road, I yelled as the coupe wobbled toward the wrong side. As if my words were a signal, he twisted the wheel, not back to the right lane where the car belonged, but across the road straight toward the rail. I think I screamed. He hunched farther over the wheel, watching the edge of the cliff come toward us and not trying to do anything to turn the car aside or stop it. I flung the door open. 
A section of the rail splintered, and then I felt the front wheels leave the ground and the nose of the car tilt downward. I jumped. My feet landed on nothing at all, but my hips and chest hit firm ground. As I pulled myself away from the edge of the cliff, I heard a distant thumping, and I knew that it was the coupe knocking against the side of the cliff as it dropped five hundred feet. On hands and knees I turned and looked down. Far below, the coupe was a splotch, darker than the vegetation. Suddenly there was a burst of flame. The coupe was burning. The driver was still in the car. If he hadn't been flung out when hit, in either case he wasn't alive. My legs wobbled as I stood up. That hadn't been an accident. Deliberately, the driver had run the car over the cliff to kill me, along with himself. But why me? If he wanted to commit suicide, why take me along with him? The answer, which was no answer, came. He had known that I would be at the railroad station and that I would want to rush to the courthouse, and he had been waiting for me. Conceivably, for some unknown reason, somebody wanted me dead. But why would this man, whom I had never seen before, try to murder me in such a way that his own death would be inevitable? A car was coming. I scooted behind a shrub. I had no time for police red tape. When the car was passed, I walked along the road toward Centre City, until a truck came along and gave me a lift. Chapter 2 the second doorway. After I had convinced the guard outside the courtroom door who I was, he let me in. The courtroom was quiet and tense. A middle-aged man, who said he was office manager of Roy Boar's chain stores, was on the witness stand. Judge Anders was leaning toward him, and his bald pate was level with the bottom stripe of a large American flag on the wall behind him. The jurors, seven men and five women, were as motionless as a snapshot. I tried to see Esther, but the heads of the spectators blocked out those who sat at the two long tables. The witness was telling District Attorney Fordman that Roy Bores had paid more attention to Esther than any of the other employees. Quite often they would closet themselves in Bores' office for long periods at a time. Did Bores do that with any of his other female employees? Fordman asked. Well, with his secretary when he dictated to her. Esther Hull was not his secretary? No. She had charge of the payroll. So there was no reason for those long conferences? Not that I know of. As noiselessly as possible, I started down the aisle. When I had almost reached the rail, the judge looked up at me and a couple of jurors seemed to find me of interest. Then a hand picked my sleeve. Harry Pollock had an aisle seat on the front bench. He shifted over to make room for me. I sat down beside him. Glad you're back, Chuck, he whispered. Esther needs you. Harry was my oldest and closest friend. A wife and two children kept him out of the army. Although he was not yet thirty, he was one of Mandate's leading businessmen, proprietor of the largest food market. How does it look? I asked. Bad. I'm sorry, Chuck. Harry whispered something else, but I didn't hear him. From where I sat, I could see Esther on the other side of the rail. She was seated at a table with a short, dumpy man. Edgar Jocelyn, her lawyer. The sight of my wife was like a blow under my heart. She was blonde and tall and very lovely. She seemed to have changed not at all in fifteen months except for tired lines about her eyes and mouth. Jocelyn rose to question Roy Bohr's office manager. He was brief, but he had no difficulty in establishing the point that Bohr's had been my friend and also Esther's, so that there there was nothing unusual or suspicious in his friendliness with her. As the witness stepped down, Ellen turned wearily in her chair, and her eyes met mine. She half rose, staring as if I were a ghost, and what colour was left in her cheeks faded. Then she turned to Jocelyn and said something to him. Jocelyn spoke to Judge Anders, who nodded, and then the lawyer came over to my bench. Utterly, as if this were a party to which I'd just arrived, he pumped my hand. You may sit at the table with us, Lieutenant. An undercurrent of voices followed me to the table. Then I was seated beside Esther, and her hot, dry hand was in mine. "'Are you feeling all right, darling?' she said. "'Were you very sick?' That was like Esther, at a time like this worrying over me. "'Esther,' was all I could say. Her eyes, very large and very grave, appealed to me. "'Darling, I didn't murder Roy Bores.' "'Of course not,' I said. The judge banged his gavel, and I had to subside. A new witness was being sworn in, the elevator operator in the apartment house where Roy Bores lived. 
He had taken Esther up to Boaz's apartment two or three times in the two weeks before his murder. On a small black table nearby, I noticed a heavy black luger. A tag marked Exhibit A was attached to it. In North Africa, I had seen numerous pistols like that on captured Nazi officers. There were lugers in this country too, of course, but how would Esther have come into possession of one? Judge Anders leaned forward, staring at something behind me, and everybody else, jurors and guards and district attorney, following the lead of the judge, looked that way too. Automatically I twisted my head. A gaunt, unshaven man was hurrying up the aisle toward us. He swung the gate open and headed directly for the judge's bench. What is it? the judge demanded. I have an urgent message, the gaunt man said. At the last moment he turned aside and swept the luger off the table. Among the spectators, a woman cried out, I saw a couple of jurors rise. The judge snapped, What do you mean? And then the gaunt man swung the muzzle of the lugar toward Esther. He's crazy, I found myself thinking. That pistol can't be loaded, and his face was not that of a killer. It was calm, practically impassive. Then I heard Esther moan. She was on her feet, cowering, her face twisted with terror. And I saw that bony hand squeeze the luger. I acted out of sheer instinct. I fell sideways off the chair, and my shoulder hit Esther's hip, knocking her against the judge's bench. The gun roared then. A pane of glass in a window in line where Esther had stood shattered. I straightened up, only part of my brain aware of the tumult in the courtroom. Before anybody could interfere, he would have time for a second shot. Esther was crouching on the floor. I could not again knock her out of the way, and he had a clear and easy shot. Astonishingly, the gun swung away from Esther and focused on me. He was not going to try again to kill Esther. I was to be the victim. I lunged at him, knowing that I couldn't possibly make it. Gun thunder drowned out the hundreds of frantic voices. But the bullet hadn't come from the Luga. The bullet was in the gaunt man's back. He pitched forward on his face. Behind him I saw the burly form of a cop, and he had a smoking service revolver in his hand. I had saved Esther's life, and the cop had saved mine. I spun toward Esther. At the foot of the judge's bench she lay crumpled in a dead faint. Chapter 3 The Third Doorway There were four of us with Judge Anders in his chamber, District Attorney Fordman, Police Captain Cotter, Edgar Jocelyn and myself. The judge fixed a stern gaze on the D.A. Were you mad, Fordman, to leave the bullets in that gun? The D.A. wiped his brow. Naturally I didn't leave it loaded. The bullets were removed by ballistics to match them up with the one found in Roy Boar's head. Since then the gun hasn't been out of the hands of the property clerk except during the trial. But the fact remains that the gun was loaded, the judge pointed out. The magazine was full except for the two slugs fired, Captain Cotter said. They were ordinary, thirty-eight Colt long cartridges. They fit without trouble in a nine-millimeter Luger. Edgar Jocelyn rubbed his plump shoulders against the back of his chair. Has the gunman been identified yet? No, and I doubt if he will be, Cotter said ruefully. There wasn't a thing in his pockets. Even his coat label had been ripped out to avoid identification. Of course we'll send his fingerprints to Washington, but I wouldn't be surprised if they're not on fire. Jocelyn growled. If your man had only wounded the gunman, we would be able to question him. It is always foolish to shoot a criminal dead. I'm sure we have no complaint to find with the officer for saving Lieutenant Hull's life, Judge Anders said. Did you recognize the man, Lieutenant? I shook my head. I never saw him before, or the man who had tried to murder me an hour before that. There was sudden tension in the room. All eyes were on me. What's the story? Fordman demanded skeptically. I told them about the man who had driven his coop off the cliff and had tried to take me along with him. Wait a minute, Captain Cotter exclaimed. You mean to say the guy deliberately killed himself so that he could kill you? There's no sense to it? No, there's no sense to it, I said slowly. Any more sense than a man walking to the front of a crowded courtroom, picking up a gun that was supposed to be empty but wasn't, and trying to shoot either my wife or myself when he knew he hadn't a chance in the world of getting away. He couldn't have committed suicide easier if he had set out to do it, yet that hadn't stopped him. Jocelyn's keen little eyes glittered. Your Honor, don't you see it? It's obvious that these murder attempts were aid only because Mrs. Hull is innocent. Obvious. 
Judge Ann's eyebrows arched. What is obvious is that Lieutenant Hull narrowly escaped with his life in an accident on the way to the trial. Under the circumstances, he doubtless misinterpreted what occurred. As for the individual who attempted murder in the courtroom, it is clear that he was a maniac. He had sense enough to cut out all marks of identification from his clothes, I said. Insanity takes many forms. Edgar Jocelyn's reputation as a shrewd criminal lawyer was earned. Abruptly, he seemed to change the subject. He said, I noticed that Artie Dart, the notorious racketeer, attended every minute of the trial. I saw him, Fordman said. He was occupying a back seat. Unfortunately, there was nothing I could do about him. Legally, his skirts are clean. What about what happened last week? Jocelyn persisted. His chief gunsel, Little Blue, shot down a man. It was Little Blue's hard luck that his victim also happened to be armed and killed Little Blue before he himself died. Or maybe it was the other way around the D.A. muttered. The fact is we have nothing on Artie Dart. What about the fact that the gunman sat near Artie Dart? Fordman shrugged. So did a lot of other people. What you're trying to do, Jocelyn, is to confuse the issue. Jocelyn wasn't one to give up easily. He appealed to the judge. It would appear, Your Honor, that somebody is trying to murder Lieutenant Hull or Mrs. Hull or both. We don't know why, but it must have some connection with the trial. In addition, a notorious gangster is taking an unusual interest in the trial. While I think I would be justified in requesting a mistrial in view of the occurrence in the courtroom, I ask at least for an indefinite postponement to clear up these mysteries. I don't see why, Judge Anders said. You have not established even a remote connection with the trial and what you call mysteries. The judge rose and we all rose with him. The trial will resume at ten o'clock tomorrow morning. Good day, gentlemen. We straggled out of the chamber. Jocelyn waddled at my side. What do you think, Lieutenant? he asked. I wish I knew. So do I. I assume that you are anxious to see your wife. I've made arrangements. Thanks, I said. In the county jail next block, a sleepy guard conducted me to Esther's cell. Ten minutes, he said, and locked me in. Esther rose from her cot, and a moment later she was in my arms. For fifteen months I had dreamed of the feel of her against me and of my mouth on hers, but her body was rigid and her mouth was cold. I released her and we sat side by side on cot. I took her hand in mine. Now tell me about it, Esther, I urged gently. There's little to tell. I went up to Roy Bohr's apartment and suddenly everything went black. Did you have many drinks? You know I hate the stuff, she said. As far as I know there wasn't even any liquor in the apartment. The police say there was liquor on your breath. But it's not true. Esther's hand tightened in mine. You believe me, darling? I no longer knew what to believe or whom to believe. All right, I said. Was Roy Bores near you when you passed out? No. Just before that he had gone into another room. When I felt I was fainting or whatever it was that was happening to me, I tried to call out to him, but I couldn't. The next question was the hardest. With an effort I got it out. What were you doing in Roy Barr's apartment? She dropped my hand and walked a few steps to the opposite wall of the cell and faced me. She was breathing heavily and her cheeks were flushed with fever. I can't remember, she said. A wave of anger swept over me. You mean, you don't want to remember? Darling, wait. She closed her eyes, swaying. You have to trust me. There's a curtain I'm trying to pierce. I know that Roy Bores had some very urgent business to attend to that night. We were going to talk it over, come to some sort of decision, but what it was. She pressed her knuckles against her temples. I can't remember. I sat on the cot looking up at her, and a numb fear possessed me. She wasn't that good an actress. Had something happened to her mind? Everything was mad, Esther murdering or being accused of murder and the strange impassive men who did not mind dying if they could take me along with them. I said, Esther, why does somebody want me dead? You mean what happened in the courtroom this morning? And before that? I told her about the car that had been driven over the cliff. Her eyes went incredibly wide, as if staring at something beyond me, beyond the cell and the building. She muttered as if to herself, There was something that happened a week before Roy Boers was shot. Our superintendent was killed by a truck while he was making the rounds of the stores. 
It was very odd how it happened. There was a strange man in the car with him, also killed. Evidently the superintendent had picked him up to give him a lift. There were witnesses to the accident. They said the stranger grabbed the wheel and swung the car straight into the oncoming truck. There it is, I thought. It's happened before. How many times? Before? The police called it an accident, I said. Yeah, that I remember that Roy Boers and I were sure it was deliberate murder. It seemed to mean much more than that our superintendent was murdered. We were very much excited. We... A vague glimmering came into her eyes. Yes, we knew why it happened. We knew everything. That was why... Then Esther screamed. She was staring sideways at the barred cell door. A man in a guard's uniform stood there peering at us through the bars. He was not the one who had conducted me to the cell. He was a heavy-set man of sixty or more, and his face was strangely rigid, without a hint of any emotion of any kind. We both knew why he was there. I watched his right hand dip down into his pocket. He would have a gun. Locked in the cell, there was no way I could stop him. There was nothing behind which to hide except a skimpy chair which would not stop a bullet. In the corridor a sharp voice demanded, Hey, what are you doing? Who the hell are you? The man at the door must have heard, but he paid no attention. His hand rose with a gun in it. Feet ran in the corridor, brought by Esther's screams and by the sight of a man in a guard's uniform who did not belong there. He's got a gun, I yelled. He's going to shoot us. I was sure then that the old man would defend himself from whoever was coming, but his gun continued to rise until the muzzle was pointed at me. Nothing in the world, no personal menace or desire to defend himself, seemed to exist for him but the terrible compulsion to murder me. I snatched up the chair and threw it at the door. It crashed against the bars, but it accomplished its purpose. The oncoming chair deflected the aim of his first shot. He did not get in a second shot. Two guns clamoured in the corridor. The old man sank to the floor. Then Esther was again in my arms, weeping against my chest. I was as badly shaken as she, though I knew from experience that I was no more of a coward than most men. This had been the closest yet. Three attempts had been made to murder me. How many more would there be before one of these incredible not-human killers succeeded? The cell door was flung open and a couple of prison guard with drawn guns entered. You all right? You got him in time, I said. Who's the guy? Where did he get the uniform? How did he get in here? Your guess is as good as mine, I said. It was a small jail and those two guards were the only ones on duty. They went out of the cell, one to report what had happened and the other to mull over the corpse. I said, Tell me now, Esther. She dug her face into my chest. Tell you what? You said that you and Roy Boers had learned everything. Her eyes lifted to mine and there was dull agony in them. I don't remember, darling. It was as if a curtain started to part, but now it's closed again. Her voice was edged with hysteria. I can't see through it. I took her back over everything that had happened, as far as I could know, but it did no good. She sat on the cot in a kind of stupor and kept shaking her head in utter hopelessness. Chapter 4 The Fourth Doorway Auntie Dart lived in a modest suburban home like hundreds of others on the outskirts of Mandale, but it wasn't easy to get into. I hadn't gone halfway up the walk to the front porch before a burly shadow slipped out of the night. What are you after, soldier? the shadow demanded. His right hand was in his pocket and thrust forward to show me that it held a gun. I want to see Artie Dart. A thin flashlight beam leaped into my face. The man grunted. That bar on your shoulder makes it okay. Artie said likely you'd be around. You walk ahead. The gunman and the light followed me onto the porch. When I reached the door, he ordered me to stop. Pressing his gun into the small of my back, he frisked me. You're clean he acknowledged, and reached around me to push open the door. Artie Dart looked more like a tired worker spending a quiet evening at home than like the ruthless gangster he was. In his cosy living room, he was seated in front of an open fire and reading a newspaper. He wore a subdued dressing gown over silk pajamas. Even at that late hour, his rugged jaw was blue with too close shaving. Well, well, Lieutenant Howell, he greeted me affably. Have a seat. Cigar? Wraith-like, the bodyguard slipped out of the room, but I was sure he didn't go far. Probably he was out in the hall with his gun handy. 
I refused Artie Dart's cigar and sat down and crossed my legs. Why are you interested in my wife's trial? I like to see how the law works. He followed his words with a chuckle, and I realized then that his nerves were raw. The chuckle was a failure. You're scared, I said. That means you're facing the same thing as my wife and I. There's a pattern in which certain unknown men murder, or try to murder, by giving their own lives. One of your men was shot dead that way. How do you know you're not next? He was trying to hide the fear that rode him, but I'd seen it in the eyes of too many men, brave men at that, not to be able to recognize it. What's up your sleeve? he asked cautiously. Together we might be able to fight it. This way all of us intended victims are scattered. We haven't a chance. For a long minute Artie Dart studied me. You're not by any chance army intelligence? No, infantry. Does the army come into whatever's going on? I don't think so. It's strictly civilian stuff. Such as... Artie Dart flipped his cigar into the fire. Don't take me for a sucker, Lieutenant. I don't need the army's help or the copper's help or anybody's. I do my own fighting. Can you? I said softly. Perhaps against the gun cells of a rival gang. You can meet guns with guns. You can shoot it out with men who are as afraid as yourself to die. But this is different. This is against men who do not take possibility of death into account. In fact, they seem to want to die. How can you fight them? You kill one and there's another, taking any kind of risk to get at you, afraid of nothing and nobody, not giving a hang about the consequences. Artie Dart was silent for a long time. He had it very bad. He was starting to sweat. A muscle in his cheek quivered. They're not human, he said hoarsely. They're fiends out of hell. They... Outside on the porch, somebody spoke in a low voice. The gangster stiffened. His hand crawled down to the pocket of his dressing gown. Feet moved into the house. The bodyguard entered the room with a mild, middle-aged man. The newcomer had a face like a rabbit, but he did not look scared. His face was a blank. Under his arm he carried an unwrapped shoebox. He says Jeff sent him, the bodyguard reported. He's got Jeff's records in that box. Artie Dart rose from the chair in a crouch. You fool. I never saw this guy before. Jeff wouldn't send a stranger or anybody with the records. This guy's one of the... His gun finished the sentence. It came out of the gangster's dressing gown pocket, a small, flat, nickeled pistol. It did not make much noise. Expression now came into the newcomer's face. For a split second after Artie Dart's gun spoke, he looked astonished. Then he started to sink. The shoebox dropped from his hand. The cover flew off. Something tinkled and almost at once a sluggish vapour rose from the floor. I started to stand up and then got control of myself and sprawled flat on my stomach. Putting my nose against the floor, I reached into my pocket for a handkerchief. I heard the bodyguard cough rackingly, and I heard Artie Dart gasp wildly. For God's sake! Open a window! Through the handkerchief pressed over my nose and mouth, I was getting strained whiffs of it. Artie Dart sent a chair crashing as he fought to reach a window. He did not know that this type of gas rises, that there is a pocket of breathable air close to the ground. Keeping close to the floor, I wiggled across the carpet. In front of my eyes a pair of feet staggered weakly. I reached for an ankle to pull Artie Dart down to comparative safety, but he fell by his own power and rolled, making hideous sounds in his throat. Standing up, he hadn't had a chance of reaching a window. I wiggled past him until my head touched the wall. A window closed, like all the others, was above me. As I primed myself to rise, I felt a blast of heat behind me. It could not have come from the fireplace. I took time for a quick look around. A furious sheet of flame blotted from sight the man who had brought the shoebox. He had incendiaries as well as gas bombs in that shoebox. The bodyguard lay motionless, though Artie Dart was still thrashing his arms. If the poison gas had not already killed them, the fire would. Quickly I rose at the window and jabbed an elbow through the pane. The current of fresh air flowing through the opening was the sweetest smell on earth. I could drop the handkerchief from my face now. I pulled up the window and threw myself out into a bed of flowers. I was sick then, but I could not afford to stay there. Incendiaries don't wait. Already the fire had reached the inside walls and was eating through them. I stumbled a hundred feet from the house and dropped on a patch of grass. People were pouring out of neighboring houses. In a few minutes the firemen would be here, but it would be too late to do anything. Artie Dart and his bodyguard and the strange man, 
who like his fellows had given his life to murder, were dead. And I was alive only because as a trained soldier I knew what to do in case of gas attack. Four times since this morning I had stood on the threshold of death. Each time I had been lucky, but I could not always be lucky. Chapter 5 The Fifth Doorway Harry Pollock and Faye Wallace were waiting for me when I entered the neat little cottage where Ether and I had lived before I had entered the army. Faye Wallace was a plump redhead who was Esther's cousin and as close to her as a sister. She greeted me gravely and said that she had dropped in to see how I was getting on. Me too, Harry said. I found Faye waiting for you and decided to eat too. You look bad, Chuck. Is the fever coming back? It wasn't fever. It was a dose of poison gas. It was strain and anxiety, but it wouldn't do any good talking about it. What I need is a drink, I said. In the cabinet there was half a bottle of rye. There since before I had left, Faye said she would go into the kitchen for glasses. When she was out of the room I said, Harry, what was Artie Dart's latest racket? Harry took time to light a cigarette. Thinking his answer over, I knew. Dart had his fingers in everything, including the black market in food. Carefully he dropped the charred match into an ashtray. Might be. Cut it out, Harry, I snapped. You'd know. You own the biggest independent food market in town. Don't think because I've been abroad that I don't know how racketeers are organizing to control the black markets. Did you buy from Artie Dart? Harry Pollock shrugged. If you didn't, you didn't get the stuff and you lost your business to competitors who aren't so squeamish. Did Roy Bors buy from Artie Dart for his chain stores? Not Roy. He had principles. It cost him a lot of business. So that's why Roy was murdered, I said. Harry stepped close to me. Drop it, Chuck. You don't know what you're up against. I know what Esther is up against. Murder and frame-up are the weapons used. Roy Bors was killed with one. They're trying to kill Esther with the other. And it's not Artie Dart who is behind it. No, Harry agreed. It's not Dart. Then who is it? Harry said. Frankly, Chuck, I'm glad I don't know. That knowledge is very dangerous. This much I can tell you. About two months ago, Artie Dart was shoved out of control of the local black market operations. We storekeepers don't know by whom. All we know is that there's a different control, and whoever is at the head is a hundred times deadlier than Artie Dart. Dart is trying to get back in, but he hasn't a chance. That's right. He didn't have a chance, I thought. And you take it lying down? I said scornfully. That's why I'm alive now, and why a lot of other store owners are alive. It's no longer a matter of buying and selling black market produce. You do it because you're afraid not to. Faye Wallace came in with three small glasses. She said breezily, did I hear you talking about black markets? Harry, I bought a chicken in your store yesterday, way above ceiling price. Then don't eat chicken, Harry muttered. He turned away from her and became absorbed in a magazine on a table. I poured rye into the three glasses and handed one to Faye and one to Harry. Faye raised her glass. To Esther, of course. Just then the doorbell rang. Harry and I looked at each other and I felt a chill crawl down my back. I put the glass on the table and went to the front door and looked out through the window. Almost I expected a mild, impassive man I had never seen before to be standing there. Actually it was Police Captain Cotter with a couple of plain clothes men. When I opened the door he strode past me into the living room without a word. He seemed disappointed at seeing nobody but Harry Pollock and Faye Wallace. Meanwhile the plain clothes men were going into other parts of the house. What are you looking for? I demanded angrily. Your wife. Faye uttered a short exclamation, but aside from that there was no sound for long seconds. She escaped from the county jail forty minutes ago, Captain Cotter said. Three men came in. They shot the two guards dead and took your wife out. The plainclothes men returned to the living room and shook their heads. You think she came here? Harry said. She couldn't have. Miss Wallace and I have been here for the last hour and a half. Cotter looked at me. I'm sure she'd tried to get in touch with you. I picked up my whiskey glass and put it down again. What makes you so sure she escaped? She could have been abducted. Nuts, Cotter said. You know what I think? The guy who was shot in the jail corridor at noon today wasn't after you like you claim. I think he was there to help your wife break out. You're crazy. Yeah, the captain jabbed a thick forefinger at me. 
All right, so you're an officer of the army and you've been in Africa all along. So I give you credit that your skirts are clean. But Esther Hull is your wife. She got running with the wrong crowd while you were away. Now you're going to bat for her. I'll defend her to the end, if that's what you mean, I told him quietly. Cotter turned as if to leave, then apparently changed his mind. By the way, Artie Dart and a couple of his gun cells were burned to a crisp in his house earlier tonight. A couple of people say they saw a soldier jump out of the burning house. Harry Pollock turned rather quickly toward the window. Faye, the drink still in her hand, gawked foolishly at me. So what? I said. I never knew the gangster. One witness said he thought the soldier was an officer. Thought, I said. The Lord doesn't consider that good enough. Where were you tonight? Minding my own business. Captain Cotter sighed and nodded to the plainclothes men. The three of them left. Faye Wallace noisily expelled her breath. So Esther escaped, and the police believe that's a sure admission of guilt. Harry Pollock swung from the window. Esther is innocent, he cried with surprising fury. Of course she is, Fay agreed. She lifted the whiskey glass to her mouth and drained every drop. I needed a drink even more than she did. My hand was an inch from the glass on the table when I heard Fay moan. She was down on the floor, her teeth clenched, her face livid. Froth was forming on her mouth. Her pupils were dilating and her body was gripped in horrible paralysis. Tossic acid, I said. Harry, get peroxide. In the medicine chest. While Harry was gone, I turned Fay over on her stomach and gave her artificial respiration. I didn't think it would help. The reaction was too quick and too violent, which meant a powerful dose. If it was prussic acid and all the symptoms indicated that it was, a three percent solution of ordinary household peroxide would help. Harry came back unscrewing the cap off the bottle as he ran, but before we could force any of the peroxide down her throat, she was dead. God, Harry moaned. His gaze swiveled about the room and stopped in horror at our untouched drinks. I picked one up and smelled the usual bitter almond odor. It was put into the bottle. Then all three of us would now be dead if Captain Cotter hadn't interrupted us, Harry gasped. Dully, I nodded. The killers were utterly ruthless. They did not care how many they murdered, of their own number as well as others, to get at their victims. Once again I had stood in the doorway to death and had not gone through it. Fay Wallace was on the other side of the door, in my place. Chapter 6 The Sixth Doorway Louise was a private mansion converted into a snug drinking place. It had no entertainment, no vulgarity, very little drunkenness. It was the place where people went when they wanted to sit down and make conversation over highballs. I wanted to sit, and I could not stand the thought of being alone. It was the evening of my second day home on sick leave. All day the reporters and the police and the district attorney had been at me. All of them were convinced that I held the key to Esther's escape from jail, the poisoning of Faye Wallace, the burning of Artie Dart, the shootings and apparent accidents. It might have been worse if Major George Olcott, militarily overpowering, had not appeared on the scene. All this might be civilian stuff, but the army is vitally concerned in its own men. They let me alone at last, but there was no place to go except Louis. As I entered, a couple of fellow officers at the bar gave me stiff nods and eyed me curiously. Everybody had read the papers, and it seemed to me that everybody in Louis was waiting for somebody to move unobtrusively to my table and put a bullet into me. I was expecting the same thing, but this time I was ready. I had my gun on me and the feel of it was greatly comforting, though it wasn't my own safety that worried me. After a while Edgar Jocelyn and Harry Pollock came in and joined me at my table. Harry, his face dark with anger, spread out an evening paper. Have you seen these stories? Harry growled. They've practically tried Esther in their columns and found her guilty. Well, escape is generally considered an admission of guilt, Jocelyn said. Harry flashed him a black look. You're a hell of a lawyer. Is that how you defend your client? Naturally, I don't believe she's guilty. Jocelyn rolled his tall glass between fleshy palms. Still, I had a very difficult time with her. Would you believe it? I, her lawyer, couldn't get a thing out of her except that she didn't murder Roy Bors. She insisted she couldn't remember anything. In fact, she couldn't even state positively to me that she hadn't murdered Bors. She said that for all she knew she might have. I said, something did happen to her memory. 
but it started coming back when I spoke to her in the cell. I think that's why she was abducted. They were afraid she'd remember too much. Ah, Harry breathed. He leaned across the table. Did she remember anything important, Chuck? Yes, I said. They waited for me to go on, and when I didn't, Jocelyn made an impatient gesture. I'm her attorney, he said. It's my job to get her off. How can I if you won't cooperate? You forget she's no longer in the hands of the law. I brooded into my drink. What she told me yesterday will help me get her back, if it's not too late. My God, Harry said. You think they'll murder her? Jocelyn answered for me. Assuming she was really kidnapped, her abductors are intent on keeping her alive, for the time being at any rate, else they would have simply killed her in her prison cell. I nodded and beckoned to the waiter for more drinks. After my third or fourth drink, Major Alcott was standing at my table. He was simply there, coming from nowhere. He said, Don't you think you've had enough to drink? I'll never have enough, sir, I said. Not until I get Esther back. He shrugged and was gone. I saw Jocelyn glance anxiously at his watch, and then he too was no longer there. Harry's face across the table watched me worriedly. Suppose they make another attempt at your life, Chuck. You'd be in no condition to defend yourself. I'd better take you home. All right, I said. Harry had to support me out of Louis. Because of the ban on pleasure driving, there were few cars in the parking space, and only one taxicab. Harry led me to it. The taxi was already occupied by a tall man whose face was in shadows. I wondered why Harry pulled me after him into the back seat, even though the stranger was there. Then I saw the gun in the tall man's hand, and it came to me that Harry hadn't any choice. The tall man brushed a hand over my uniform and lifted my gun. Then the taxi started rolling. Harry was talking in a thin, frantic voice, but nobody paid any attention to him. His words didn't make sense to me. I figured he was crazy with fright. I slumped low in the seat and looked at the tall man. In the semi-darkness, his face consisted of sharp planes, but I could distinguish enough of it now to see the smug triumph in it. He, unlike the other killers, was capable of emotion. But not the driver of the taxi. Once, when we stopped for a taxi light, he turned in his seat and I saw the dull, impassive eyes I had seen in other faces. Somehow I feared him more than the tall gunman. The taxi stopped. We were in darkness as we got out, and I could not tell where we were. The tall man sprayed a flashlight beam on us and ordered us forward. I staggered a few steps and fell. Drunk as an officer and a gentleman, the tall man chuckled. Pick him up! Pick him up! Harry helped me to my feet. Holding me, he guided me into a house. It was dark in there, too. We started up a hall. Harry's voice again jabbered with terror, but it was receding and all at once I realized that it was the tall man who was holding me now. Harry had vanished somewhere in the long hall. Then I was in a room, dark also except for a white, blinding light at one end. I was thrust into a chair and forced to look at the light. The tall man stood at my side, his gun covering me. There was another man in that room, unseen in the darkness behind me. Under the white light hung a large disc of many colors. As I looked at it, it started to whirl. I tried to take my eyes from it, but could not. Remorselessly, the disc held my gaze until its insane whirling seemed to enter my brain and possess it. A soft, intimate voice started to speak to me. Tell me everything she told you. Of course, I heard myself reply. She said, Your men are all right. The colonel told me that the casualties were extremely light. I said, No, those mortars were blasting us to bits. She said, it always seems worse than it is. Lieutenant, you took the position, didn't you? It'll be over in less than a week, they say. I said, and I had to get this damn fever, if it had at least been a bullet. She said, you've done enough talking now, Lieutenant. A harsh voice broke in. What the hell's he batting about? Shh, the soft voice said. Lieutenant Hull, where was this? In an army hospital in Algiers. And the woman was a nurse? Yes, yes. I couldn't tear my eyes away from the whirling discs. The soft voice said, That's not the woman I mean. What did your wife tell you in the prison cell? About the black market. In the room somebody drew in his breath sharply. What about the black market? I said nothing. 
The soft, intimate voice kept nagging at that question, approaching it from many angles, but always getting back to it, and several times I started again to tell him about the nurse in the army hospital. Hell, the harsh voice growled, let me beat it out of him. No, no, the soft voice said. Crudeness won't work. He is not yet completely recovered from the fever, which makes it difficult. Let's try giving him a rest. The whirling of the discs stopped. Sighing, I closed my eyes. When I opened them, the white light was still there. I turned my head. I was seated at the outer fringe of light, and at my side, the very tall man was a distorted shadow. The gun was firm in his hand. The owner of the soft voice was lost in the darkness farther back. Suddenly, I threw myself sideways. The tall man was taken completely by surprise. My shoulder hit his stomach. My hands closed over his gun wrist. He had inches over me in height, but he was thinner and weaker, and he was not prepared for my attack. He shrieked as my hands twisted his wrist. His gun dropped to the floor. Both of us dove for it, but he was off balance. I got to it first. As I scooped it up, the roar of another gun filled the room. The bullet did not come close. The owner of the soft voice shot too hurriedly. I spun with the tall man's gun and fired at the flash. I didn't hit anything either, but he hadn't the courage to stand up against another man's gun. A door opened and closed, and he was gone. I started after him and then checked myself, remembering that the tall man, having taken my gun from me in the taxi, had two of them on his person. And when I looked back, he was on his knees, with my heavy army automatic lined in my heart. There wasn't enough distance between us for him to miss. For the sixth time since yesterday morning I had a foot through death's doorway. The tall man was a professional killer, but so, in a different sense, was I. I had been trained to kill my country's enemies, and he was certainly one of them. I did not have to move my gun to snap a quick shot. My bullet beat his by a fraction of a second. It was all that was necessary. Chapter 7 The Seventh Doorway Abruptly, the single white light at the end of the room went out. I was in black darkness. The two windows, I had noticed, were barred. The door through which the soft-voiced man had fled was probably the only way out. I strained to hear whether the door was opening. Somewhere far off and below me a woman screamed, Esther, who but Esther? I crouched over the body of the tall man I'd killed and faced the door. Suddenly it was wide open, and from the hall beyond light flowed through. A man stood there with a tommy gun ready to rake the room with slugs. He was a sitting duck for me. I shot him dead with the guide taken from the tall man. And then it was over for me. Out of the darkness behind me, two men hurled themselves at my back. There must have been another entrance to the room, and the man with the tommy gun had been sacrificed to put me off guard. I had no chance. They tore the gun from my hand and beat me down to the floor. Light snapped on overhead. The two men rose. Both of them were armed. There was no menace in their eyes, no hostility. There was only that terrible blankness I had come to know so well. They would kill me without emotion, and they would kill themselves in the same way if they were told to. Evidently, I was not yet sated for death. One of them prodded me with his gun. Without a word, they forced me up the hall and down a flight of stairs. I could still hear the screaming louder now, rasping in strident, never-ending waves. Somewhere I found the self-control not to hurl myself at my two captors. We were in a cellar. One of the men stepped around me and opened door. The second thrust me through. Behind me the door slammed shut. It was a large, windowless room, and at the farther end of it Esther sat on her legs. Her hands covering her face did not still her screams. Harry Pollock was there, too. It was because of what they had done to him that Esther was screaming. They had stuck a knife into his throat. He lay on his back with the handle of the knife still protruding, and his dead eyes were staring at Esther. I was shaking with rage as I dropped down beside Esther. I pulled her hands from her face. I said, It's me. Chuck, look at me. Her screams did not stop. I slapped her hard on each cheek, and it was as if I snapped a connection in her voice. She brushed her wild hair from her eyes and looked at me. Chuck, darling, she said, and fell into my arms. She wasn't mad. Not yet, anyway, though I doubt if it would have taken much longer. They killed poor Harry in front of my eyes, she moaned. They said they'd do the same to me if I didn't tell them what I had told you when you visited me in prison. They didn't believe me. 
Believe what? That I couldn't tell you anything because I couldn't remember. I still can't remember what Roy Bors and I were doing. All I know is that it was terribly important. Then the soft voice spoke outside the door. Well, Lieutenant, are you ready to tell me what you told your wife in prison? Did you repeat it to the police or to Major Alcott or to anybody? I was silent. Very well, the voice said. Look at Harry Pollock and you can see what will happen to your wife, and to you also unless you cooperate. I waited a few seconds before replying. All right, Jocelyn, I'll make a deal with you, but only if I can talk to you face to face. Jocelyn, Esther gasped. I nodded and removed my arms from about her and stood up. The door opened and Edgar Jocelyn, Esther's fat lawyer, entered. He remained on the threshold, keeping the full length of the room between us, and he had a gun. So she told you after all, he said. I shook my head. Your identity is a complete surprise to her. But in Louise you told Harry Pollock and me that she had told you. I lied, I admitted. I wasn't sure that it was you. It might have been Harry or somebody else. But at any rate it had to be somebody who could follow my movements closely, who knew exactly on which train I was coming home and when I was visiting Esther in her cell. And I recalled that you used to dabble in hypnotism as a hobby. The only way to get myself taken to Esther was to make the head criminal believe that she had told me everything. It worked. You had to find out how much information I had passed on to others so that you could know where you stood. You weren't drunk, of course. I was cold, so, I said. At my feet, Esther wailed. Why did you do it, darling? Now he'll kill both of us. Neither of us paid any attention to her. At the moment, it was between Jocelyn and myself, facing each other across Harry Pollock's body. Jocelyn said, That's why I couldn't hypnotize you. You knew what was happening, so you were able to establish a resistance against it. I nodded. It became plain after a while, what you had done to Esther. She and Roy Bors had the dirt on you as head of the black market racket. They were accumulating evidence. You could have had them murdered the way you had the others, but the whole basis of your power was terror. You demonstrated by having only Roy Bors murdered and Esther framed for it. Many in the trade must have known the truth, including Harry Polk, but they were afraid to say anything. The uncanny way you managed it increased their fear, because the frame-up would have backfired if Esther had told at her trial what she and Roy Bors had learned about you and your racket. But she couldn't remember. Those damnable discs of yours did it. You hypnotized her into forgetting. Jocelyn's jowls seemed to drop. I was afraid, he mumbled. The sight of her husband she had not seen for fifteen months might be dangerous. You were better than you thought, I said. You feared that the mind of the man she loved was stronger than your post-hypnotic suggestion. She might have come out of it when I spoke to her. Maybe she would have, but I didn't have enough time with her. You took no chances, though. You tried to have me killed when I left the station and later in the courtroom. You were desperate. You sent one of your men into the jail to shoot me. And because you did not know how much she actually told me, you had to keep trying to eliminate me. Esther rose at my side. Her eyes were very red. She said slowly, It's coming back, Edgar Jocelyn and the black market. Roy Bors would buy only legitimate merchandise and meat. He learned that Jocelyn was the one who had taken Artie Dart's place. I helped him whip his evidence into form. I went up to his apartment to make the final copy of the evidence to turn over to the district attorney. But there was one thing we couldn't understand, those weird men of his who willingly killed themselves in order to kill others. I couldn't understand it either, I told her. Even when I realized that hypnotism was being used, I couldn't see it, because it is impossible to hypnotize a person to do anything which violates his personal code. You could get professional killers who thought nothing of taking human lives, but to make men commit suicide under hypnotic suggestion didn't seem reasonable. I turned back to Jocelyn. Then I saw it. There are drugs which will put people into an advanced state of depression, sapping them of the desire to live. In that state you hypnotized your killers. They carried out your orders to the letter, not afraid to die themselves because they wanted to die. The lawyer gave me a pleased smile. It's not easy, but I did it. I couldn't fight Artie Dart with just another gang of gunmen. He is too experienced in that type of warfare. But these gunmen of mine who did not mind dying, there was no fighting them. Their peculiar method of murder strikes special terror into people's hearts. I knew. 
I thought of the raw nerves of a tough, fibred killer in his own right like Artie Dart. I thought of my own fear, which had gone beyond anything I had experienced on a battlefield. But now it's over, I said. Jocelyn frowned, studying me cautiously. He was wondering at what I had told him, the very things that made our living useless to him. Do you think I will let you and your wife live now? he said. I shrugged. Call in your killers. You haven't got the guts to do it yourself. His thick lips peeled back over his teeth. I watched the pudginess of his hand on the gun. The muzzle gaped widely at me, the seventh and final doorway to death. At my side, Esther moaned. I turned to her and whispered, Drop to the floor. When I turned back to Jocelyn, there was a gun in my hand. I doubt if Jocelyn had ever personally fired a gun in his life, always before his hypnotized dupes had done his killing for him. And now, when he had to rely on himself, he was slow and awkward. He never pulled that trigger. I shot once, carefully, and the slug entered his heart. Like an echo to my shot, gun slammed elsewhere in the cellar. I had been moving away from Esther in order to draw fire exclusively on myself when the others came in. But they did not come, and there was more shooting. Incredulously, I stared at the open door, waiting. Then a man plunged through it with a drawn automatic. My gun snapped up before my eyes took in the olive drab uniform and the MP armband on the soldier's sleeve. Here he is, the MP yelled. A second MP entered, followed by the severely erect figure of Major Alcott. He looked down at the body of Edgar Jocelyn, then at Harry Pollock, and finally across the room at Esther and myself. Well, it seems you were doing all right, Chuck, he said, with only the mere trace of a smile. You didn't do so badly, sir, I told him. What brought you? You did. You've had too many close shaves, and you're too valuable a soldier to be lost in a civilian rumpus. I'm not sure yet what it's all about, but I'm glad I asked the military police to keep their eyes on your movement. So am I, sir. I felt the pressure of Esther's body. She was staring in wonder at the gun in my hand. I, I was sure we were doomed. It doesn't seem possible that they didn't take the gun away from you. They did, but only one gun, I explained. I'd taken my gun as well as his from the tall man while I waited upstairs in the darkness. They didn't think to search me because they couldn't think. Jocelyn had made them into automatons. They were told to take a gun away from me, and they did. They obeyed their orders exactly and literally. Esther slid her hand through my arm. Let's go home, darling, she said. The End And so ends the gripping tale of Seven Doorways to Death. Did it thrill you? Did it leave you breathless? Or nibbling your fingernails to the quick? Let us know in the comments. Until next time, armchair detective, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you never miss another exhilarating tale of murder, mystery, and suspense from tales of murder for readers with time to kill.